Hey everybody, it's uh, Chris over at Dixieland Farm, and today I'm going to make a video about uh, my mom and her uh, passing. And I thought maybe this uh, video might help some of you. It's really for me just to kind of get it out, uh, because I don't have many people to talk to, really. Uh, just you, and uh, even at that, uh, the one thing this experience uh, solidified for me is that, uh, you know, uh, you don't have many people in your life, really that are there for you. Uh, friendships are really a <laughs> matter of convenience, uh, really. Uh, you know, your, your friends growing up is because you lived next to them or you made friends because you were near them, right? But uh, yeah, uh, I didn't have, I had a couple of people reach out, but other than that, I, I other than your family, uh, you know, you don't have really people that are gonna keep checking on you. And one of those people died. It was my mom. And again, I'm sharing this video because uh, maybe this will be helpful to some of you and there's no comments needed here. Uh, so I've got them turned off. So my mom was 79 years old. She was uh, living on her own uh, in town by me so I could check up on her. Our relationship had uh, changed over the years. Um, about 10 years ago, we were describing some of the behaviors of my mother uh, to a psychiatrist, friend, acquaintance, and uh, she's like, oh, so when was she diagnosed uh, bipolar? And I'm like, well, well, she wasn't. Uh, oh, she's like classic bipolar in behavior. So I, I, I finally had like a diagnosis of what she was going through. And uh, my mother's of a generation that does not really believe too much in self-care and uh, certainly when it comes to psychological matters. But my mother would have two states. Uh, for those of you who don't quite know bipolar or how it applies in this situation, you have two states. You have uh, like ecstatic and euphoric. You can do anything. The world's there. Make big decisions with no thought, just go into it. Give away all your possessions, give away your money, and instantly change that direction and just, nope, give it, switch on to something else. And then a very low depressed valley. So you could be really high or really low. Bipolar. So uh, knowing this piece of information, you can understand, and I was able more to predict. So uh, that euphoric part, I mean, also they can turn on you real quick, real angry, real mean. And uh, she had done a couple of things that were just, we had to distance ourselves, uh, my wife and I, to protect ourselves. So we had to keep her at an arm's length at that point. Um, or to, for example, uh, Marissa would not come to a Mother's Day dinner for my mom because of things that she said and did uh, to Marissa while Marissa was trying to help her during a medical thing, uh, taking her to doctor's offices and stuff like that. So I'm like, well, it's my mom. I'm, I'm gonna, I have to do this, right? Mother's Day. So I went over to her house and my mom sat me down before we went out to, to dinner and proceeded to yell at me for an hour straight. Like everything, and when it was a word salad jumble of like every grievance, a lot of them had nothing to do with me, just everything for an hour straight. So my gift to her that year was to take it. I let her get it out, uh, except for to one point. One point she starts pointing her finger at me. And so, I mean, I was calm and just was listening to but at that point, when she started pointing her finger at me, I said, you point your finger at me one more time, I'm going to break that thing right off, your, right off your hand. And she stopped. I think she realized that I wasn't going to take it, or she uh, got a quick shot of what she was doing. I'm not sure which. So again, mother with that kind of mental state. And I'm bringing this up with specifics so that way you can understand the dynamics here of her passing. 
because uh, being bipolar does not mean you are incapable of rational thought or rational actions. You are in charge of your actions there, right? So there's nothing you can do from an external person uh, point of view, right? She can make bad choices. She is legally free to do that. You can't do anything about that. All right. Mix in this time during one of these uh, euphoric periods in June of 2022. She got a whole bunch of new friends, which is a classic bipolar thing. Uh, the friends that you get often um, somehow know and are people that can use and take advantage of you. That's the kind of people that attract each other. So she had a bunch of new friends. She had a boyfriend who was half her age, uh, would occasionally uh, move in, live with her, whatever. She wanted me to know they weren't sleeping together, but she was in love. She had homeless people come in. She had uh, drug people come in. She didn't take drugs, but she wanted to take care of these people. Or they were all mixed together. I don't know. Uh, I don't know chicken or egg on this one. But she was acting erratic. She was also uh, running up a large amount of debt in her name. Um, again, bad choices aren't against the law. As a son, all I could do is make suggestions. And I did. And her uh, brother, who she talked to uh, via phone, also made suggestions. There was nothing we could really do other than that. She would get into fights with her neighbor. Her neighbor also uh, may have had uh, lots of problems. Sheriff's office called, restraining orders placed or applied for. A lot of drama. Um, so we know what she was living was not working out for her. And it was a bad situation. And the people in her life were making her worse. Uh, we knew that. But that is all you can really do. You can just know it. Uh, and somewhere in August, uh, so she gets uh, angry that I don't want to be involved with uh, these people, uh, or particularly her boyfriend. Uh, don't want to see him. Don't want to go out to dinner and meet him uh, because I know what's going on, right? So somewhere around August, she calls me up. She is uh, threatening to kill herself. And we were on weird speaking terms at that point already, but it's okay. I, do you want to go to the hospital? Yes. Uh, so I take her to the hospital. I explain to the doctor what's going on. The doctor starts asking my mother questions. You know, how do you feel? Eh, I'm okay. I'm like, so what about, did you, did you threaten to kill yourself? Well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, so I get the doctor aside. I'm like, hey, so she's never been diagnosed bipolar, but um, this is what she does. And he says, oh, okay. So he also agrees. And uh, she gets admitted to a, uh, a facility, 72 hour hold or something like that, but she uh, extends it. When she gets out, she said, things are going to change. Starting with you. <laughs> with me. And uh, I said, well, I said, if these people are involved in your life and you're living where you're living, I cannot be a part of that. And she was shocked and upset, which I get, but... That's the only power I had for her to start making some choices because she was in a facility and she was already coming out ready to continue on as if nothing happened. So she was there for a week or two and uh, 
going through the notes, the sense of delusion was, was great. And also in the notes, so uh, I, I said to my mother, you know, you being bipolar, huh? I've never been diagnosed bipolar. And I, I actually saw from the facility the notes, bipolar, like, like, like underlined. And she was on medication for bipolarism, uh, which she did not seem to understand. So, uh, yeah, it was a couple of weeks. And uh, after that, where we didn't talk, uh, I think I tried to call once and she hung up on me. Or another time she called, oh yeah, she called me up. And she wanted me to bring her food, from like 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 a delivery service. And I'm like, "Do you have a car? Yeah. You have money? Yeah." It's, 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 and then she hung up on me. Uh, it was difficult, difficult to to make that choice, but she was acting erratic. I mean, and I haven't even described to you some of the scenarios that she would talk about or conversations she would have you know, calling me up six times in a row at work to ask extremely ridiculous trivia questions and then just hang up you know it was being intrusive uh, to my life it was affecting my relationship with my wife even she was there for me but I mean it was starting to become a problem We also forgot to mention, so during that, um, that brief period where she was uh, away, I went and changed the locks of the house. I didn't want these people in her house, um, homeless people and people taking advantage or whatever. I, have, uh, I had health care power of attorney and I was her son. That's, that's all I had. So I changed the locks with the landlord's permission and agreeing and said something wrong with these people and this, this, is, this is the problem. Uh, and then while she was in the facility, I got a frantic phone call. Somebody's trying to break into my house. I said, no one's trying to break into your house. I've changed the locks. It's fine. No, no, someone's breaking into my house. And my boyfriend's there right now. I said, well... Then how is someone breaking in the house if he's there? Uh, no, no, no. He, he, go, go, he, you know, go there and 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 and, and check. I said okay, well I'm not going in if someone's breaking into your house. I'll, have, I'll call the sheriff's office. No, you got to go. Call the sheriff's office. I'm like, listen, this is what I'm, I'm getting a phone call about. I don't know what what's facing me on there. Will you will you please meet me at uh, my mother's house and see what's going on? So we go, and there is no evidence of anybody breaking into the house. The uh, boyfriend is there in a, uh, well, let's just say amped up state. I don't know if he was on something or not. He's just excited, but I mean, he was, he had the eyes. And that's when he says, you know, my stuff's in there. And the sheriff's like, is his stuff in there? Didn't see any stuff from anybody in there. So I, I opened the door and I let the sheriff in. We look around. We don't really see any evidence of his stuff. Uh, but he's like, I got her on the phone. So he's bugging my mom while she's in a facility, a mental health facility. I don't know how he can call her. You need a special code to even get in to call somebody. But all right. My mother says on the phone, he is my guest and he is allowed to stay there. So the sheriff said, he has every right to, to be here. I'm sorry. Uh, I wish that wasn't the case because they knew exactly who this guy was. I said, fine. So I went and changed the locks back. A whole bunch of stuff happened. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know. Anyway, we go to Disney, and I uh, get a phone call while we're at Disney uh, from the landlord. Hey, there's some people trying to... Uh, oh, actually, roll that back just, just a little bit. Uh, right before we leave for Disney, my mom 
falls and breaks her hip. We don't hear about it because we are not talking. Uh, but I, somehow we, we found out, I think from the neighbor or something who called me. Oh yeah, the neighbor called me and asked about the dog. You know, somebody taking care of the dog. I'm like, well, I don't know. Nobody, nobody called me, nobody talked to me. So, we find out that, yep, the neighbor's taking care of the dog now. It's okay. Okay. Landlord calls me up while we're at Disney. People are breaking into the house. I was like, I don't, I've heard that before, but I don't know anything about that. Um, the neighbor's taking care of the dog. The one that she had a fight with <laughs> at some points, right? So I, I just don't understand, right? But And I'm in Florida. There's not, not really much I can do. What about uh, her boyfriend? Her boyfriend was supposed to be taking care of the dog and apparently taking care of the dog meant locking him up uh, via chain and putting him outside with a water bowl for the whole day. So that was problematic. And okay, so we finally... Uh, like here, here's the person's number. This is all. I, this is all I got. I mean, there's not much I can do. He's allowed to be there. Well, I don't want him there. I'm like, yeah. Well, according to the law, the second you say someone's invited into your house, they have the exact same rights as if they're a tenant, whether they're on the lease or not. He's like, well, I didn't know that. And I'm like, man, I didn't know that either until the sheriff told me. So he had every right as if he was the owner to do whatever he wanted in there because he was the guest, and that guest. You basically have squatting rights. You could even revoke them, but once you say it's okay, at least in North Carolina, they can just stay, and you have to do a full eviction. So, yeah, we get back from <laughs> Florida, and uh, there's a phone call from my mom. Uh, that you know, she's still in the hospital with her um, recovering. They were going to replace her hip, so. Uh, the boyfriend had taken the van and brought it back to my mother's house at some point, probably partially living in the house at some point. I think uh, the neighbor says the dog is crazy. You got to get get rid of the dog. So we come pick up the dog and, you know, start taking care of the dog. Uh, my mother gets transferred at some point to a short-term care facility and not really told too much. Uh, my mom's not really still uh, talking to me, even though I keep trying to find out stuff. Um, and then at some point she just switched. Uh, this is where... This is where we start to realize something's wrong with my mother's thinking. So I get a call out of the blue I'm being discharged from the uh, short-term care facility. I'm, I'm to go home. I said, okay, you're gonna have your boyfriend pick you up? No, you're gonna pick me up. So, when, you, when do you need to be picked up? Now! So we had to basically drop everything and go pick her up. And uh, she was in no condition to be on her own. She could not stand on her own, uh, even though she had physical therapy, right? She could kind of get up on a walker, but she, she didn't have the um, strength to hold herself up. So we're like, are you, are you sure she's discharged? She's discharged, she is free to go. She has to go home. And how, you know, how will you be taking care of her? I'm like, well, I'm, I'm not taking care of her. Okay, well, we'll send a, a nurse, you know, once, once a day. Okay, take her home and she is unable to get out of the vehicle. She was unable to stand on her own. She was unable to get up the steps to her house. There was no way a walker was going to fit through the narrow doorways in her old house that she was renting. And again, she was unable to stand on her own. She fell four times just getting up the steps and it was very difficult to get her up and my mother realized she could not care for herself. Call up the short-term care facility. I'm like, she shouldn't have not been discharged. She's got to go back. Like, well, we can't take her back. That's not how this works. You have to 
uh, basically bring her to the hospital and go through the whole process again, which is what we do. We bring her back to the hospital. She is in pain. She fell. She is unable to care for herself. We are unable to care for her in the way that she needs uh, physically. We couldn't pick her up, so if we can't pick her up, what can we do? We're, we're, not, we're of no help, right? We also run a full business where we're both working all the time. So they admit her back to the hospital, and in a few days they admit her back to the short-term care facility. And so I go and take time off work, and take a lot of time off work, by the way, um, here and there to do this. And I go in, and I'm like, why did you guys discharge her? Because uh, I was talking to the social worker. And she said, yeah, that was her idea, and we can't keep her, and she's free to make her own decisions, whether they're good decisions or bad decisions. So we needed her to fail so she would know that she is unable to take care of herself anymore. That is the way the system is designed, right? That is the way this has to work. My mother understood that at that point. So her short-term care facility was becoming a long-term care facility. I go into her house and start looking, and the uh, the debts she had incur incurred were were tremendous. Uh, well, not tremendous, really. Um, they're all credit card debts. It's like six, and she had weird receipts everywhere, and she had like a pack rack pack rat mentality. So. Um, Everything she ever bought for her boyfriend, including meals, was in a big <laughs> staple thing of receipts. Not very helpful, but it was a lot. And uh, realized she, she lent him, I think, $3,000 to start a business and bought a lawnmower that he was going to fix up and turn around and sell uh, and make, make money. You know? <laughs> and, uh, a bunch of stuff. Just unable to be recovered and gone, which is fine. But it was, a, it was a thing, right? And uh, when she was, uh, I went and visited her in the long-term care facility because uh, she was, I guess, really honoring what I had said, right? She was no longer seeing those people and she was not in her living conditions. So I started coming around more and more often. And it didn't take long before I realized she was starting to lose uh, touch with reality. Uh, she would ask for her mother, who had died 20 years ago, that she was outside the window, um, and just slowly talking about things, and you're like, oh, she is not completely here anymore. And part of that is um, what they call hospital-induced delirium. You're in a hospital so much, people are constantly waking you up, the beeping, the buzzing, the doors open, right? The noise of people in the hallway, no matter how quiet it is, it's never quiet in a hospital, right? You start to lose uh, touch with reality. Plus the bipolar, uh, and then starting to look back on it, getting dementia. So dementia, you can make bad choices until you can be at a level of dementia where you cannot take care of yourself, there's very little you can do as a person watching this. She was able to drive, she was able to f eat, take medicine, go to the bathroom, take a shower. She is completely competent. So I had to apply to become her legal guardian so I could uh, straighten up the mess that she was in which I did, and that involved a lawyer having to come out and assess her, and then we had to go to the court. And it was not a big deal, but it was a process. And so I had to go through the legal process of that, and I finally became her legal guardian, uh, because your healthcare power of attorney does not really cover those kind of things. You can't sell, um, you know, part of her estate, right? You can't move money around and things like that. And I had to 
figure out pin numbers and where did she keep stuff and she had a storage unit and what was the storage unit and what was the lock what, what key went to that lock and I had to discover all of that and I had to go through all of her stuff uh, and because of her uh, mindset I mean inside the middle of a magazine would be like a, a pin number <laughs> inside a brochure would be my social security number stored on a piece of paper or my brother's and birth dates and did the boyfriend have access to this stuff i don't know um but yeah 30 40 years of paperwork just in envelopes and you have to go through it and figure out well where are the accounts what 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 does she have them does she have this does she have that it's a very time-consuming process and then cleaning out the house so she collected antiques for years so there was a whole storage unit full of antiques and there's antiques here and there's tchotchkes everywhere in the house that you have to do something with and go through and does it have any value and does it not have any value and i have a brother and what is he entitled to and we had to figure that out and my brother is not like me we are not like each other at all so and he does not live nearby so uh contacting him you know days and days of no response and you get like a three word response so what does he want what would he do it took it took a bit to go through that uh she develops an infection she's had a uh, urinary tract infection on and off but this also causes uh delirium this also causes problems and eventually uh somewhere in october she starts to lose um after she gets readmitted again to a hospital um she has a a, a semi-stroke at some point another infection and you know we we talk about uh treat in place with the the long-term care facility what that means is don't send them to the hospital every time you send them to the hospital is more of a chance of that delirium of not being in a uh a static location that, that they know right and that causes a and i talk to another doctor and another doctor and another doctor but anytime they they have that change of a venue takes part of the brain it's an assault on the brain you lose you don't it's not temporary you lose it You're, you get another hit so the fall uh hit the bipolar is a hit the um moving to the long-term care facility is a hit the people in her life and then not being there right because once actual stuff happened they were gone right you know because of course they are right they were all in it for uh <laughs> for part of it not the whole thing right so that's a chip and then uh moving rooms chip and then going home chip so it's 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 chipping away at her right so back to the hospital and at some point in that one stay she starts losing uh the ability to make uh, cohesive sentences she can say words but uh, they are completely jumbled and she she knows what she means but it's just not coming out so you'd have to sit there and decipher and then every once in a while you get a moment of clarity a moment of clarity that she knows exactly what's going on with her life she knows exactly the situation she's in and you got it for like 10 seconds and then talking about going to the fair and the, the, there's a, a cow at the fair and the, the cow tries to bite her in the middle of the field last night uh and how old are you and it's the fourth of july right and then i don't want to live like this i don't want to live in a place like this anymore i'd rather die grandma saw you know came came last night she had a pie bop 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 that is what happens and uh yeah that's that's hard i'm gonna be honest with you it, it, it's it's it was hard it was hard to watch it was hard to go through it was hard to figure out what the right thing to do is and how to help her um, but we know 
at this point that normal life is over and somebody's got to pay for this and she has no money and she has no uh, retirement at all uh, going through the bank records she was spending more than she had even if she you know when she didn't have credit card debt she could make it and have like an extra hundred or two hundred uh, uh, a month with food and, and shelter and all that kind of stuff right in the car but uh, you know now no and uh, so I had to apply for her Medicaid that is an entire process applying for Medicaid you actually normally have to hire somebody to go through the process but I figure it out and uh, she gets approved she gets approved it takes a while and it's retroactive it's retroactive back all the way to, to August which is nice it's a three-month retroactive process so but that process took a uh, month and a half to get her onto Medicaid it's enough for the long-term care facility as long as you were in the process they were fine with it so at least that was good and same thing with the hospitals she gets back to the long-term care facility they move her to a different room because they know it's going to be more of a long-term care thing so she has a roommate and uh, she gets another infection they send her back to the hospital even though I said not to I also say the medications she's on for the bipolar disorder is is probably causing the problems because certain medications are not good for the elderly they are black labeled they could cause strokes and death and certain uh, degenerating effects of the mind so I wanted to get her off this one medication uh, that they put her on and they don't want to do that because she's docile and maybe coming off this medication she wouldn't be docile but I said she's unable to walk what's she gonna do she's not gonna bite you she's not gonna run after you so uh, I have to fight with doctors on that and uh, doctors in the ER agree with me but uh, the facility doctors you, you get what you get and uh, you get what you pay for uh, and so it's a lot of back and forth and a lot of consultations and you know somebody dropping the ball and you got to keep up on it and keep check on them and yeah uh, so this next time she goes back to the hospital I didn't want her to go back uh, because I didn't want to chip away anymore uh, I remember coming to see her in the hospital and she's just in the room just there crying when I, when I show up she didn't know where she was she didn't know why she was there and yeah so I was able to calm her down and um, I said I she shouldn't be here she you know we said treat in place uh, this is not treating in place she brought her back to the hospital here and uh, at that point she starts losing the ability to talk at all all she can do is uh, moan or kind of hum <laughs> You can occasionally pick up a pattern of what she's trying to say, but, uh, you know, uh, yes, uh, you know, that's it. That's uh, what she was uh, being reduced down to. Uh, I wanted to get out of that hospital as quickly as possible once her uh, white blood cell count became manageable. Send her back to the place, please. They kept her for a week because the insurance wouldn't pay for her. So they kept her until the insurance would pay for her visit. I'm going to say that one more time because I'm sure a lot of my foreign uh, friends uh, would not even understand this. The insurance would not pay for the hospital visit. It was not deemed necessary, even though the long-term care facility did think it was necessary and sent her. So instead of releasing her, they held her until the insurance company would pay for her visit after the doctors had to constantly tell the insurance people why they had her and why it was necessary, even though I didn't want her there. It was doing harm to her being there. They kept her for a full week because the insurance company wouldn't pay, even though the doctors wanted her there. The doctors wanted to release her. But they wouldn't release her till the insurance company paid. Does, does all that make sense to you? So after a week, the insurance company relented, paid, so they could release her. 
to get out of the hospital. I'm seeing my mom once or twice a week, I'm dealing with all this. Uh, I, the guardianship, once I get granted the guardianship, uh, which is also, you know, the sheriff's office has to come and serve her because, you know, it's, it's normally meant for, you know, people on drugs and stuff like that. So I warned my mother, but who knows if she remembered or understood. So I'm sure that was a thing to deal with. Uh, so I start figuring out her finances and start drafting letters of uh, basically, you know, she is judgment proof was the uh, legal term, meaning you could sue her, but you, you can't get anything. So it is not even worth bothering suing her. Because you won't get anything. She has nothing, so your debts will not be paid. It's it's going to cost you more money to just come to this conclusion. And here's the proof, right? So I sent the paperwork and, and then sent that. And uh, you know, some responded and some didn't. And then you have to deal with those responses and give them, you know, the pieces of information that they're requesting. Uh, I'm not liable for any of it, right? But I'm just acting on her behalf. And so uh, the... Right before Thanksgiving, the long-term care facility sends her to the hospital. Uh, once again, huge infection. You know, failure kind of stuff, right? Uh, so she's back to the hospital again. Again, sort of against my wishes, but, you know, it's okay. Um... It develops into a MRSA infection, so she gets put into a uh, infectious ward. We come and see her on Thanksgiving morning. Uh, you have to gown up completely. So, you know, now she has these aliens coming with blue smocks, masks, everything covered. So all she can see is this of me and, and Marissa. And we spend time with her. And uh, she is uh, not speaking... Right, she's she can only kind of moan in pain, and wail a little bit. And at one point, so we're just spending time with her, and we're just uh, we put on the dog show, and you know she looks up at the dogs because that's what, something we always did every Thanksgiving, and she you know, oh, oh, like that. So she she's the sounds she would have made um, in previous years. Uh, we go to dinner, lunch for Thanksgiving out. We come back to the farm, we clean uh, the farm. We didn't, we didn't have help that day because it's Thanksgiving. So we do everything. And uh, you know, we get a call from the doctors. Uh, yeah, I think she should come back. I'm like really, we, we were there today. Yeah, no, I think she should come back. So we do and we have somebody else take care of the, the, the farm for the night, for the night checks. Uh, so she's unable to breathe and going through the uh, what are her wishes? Well, she never wanted to be resuscitated. You know, she never wants to be tubed. And, you know, <laughs> I pull up a copy of the uh, living will and instead of initialing the thing she wanted, she initialed every option. So they're, they all, they're all conflicting. Uh, that's why you got to read those things. So, uh, I'm explaining to the doctor, listen, I know what she, what she meant and what she wanted. And this is, so we're going through and, um, you know, she can't, she's just moaning and her eyes are rolled back in her head and, and she can't breathe at all. She's struggling for every single breath. Uh, I'm holding her hand at one point, just the slightest that she came back. Uh, at one point, I mean, because she can't focus, she can't see anything. She she does sort of lock eyes with me for five seconds, and back out. So 
So I say to her something she said to her mother when my grandmother was dying. I say pretty close, but in a little bit more in my own words, uh, which was, uh, I said to her, you can stay if you want to stay and I will be here. And if you want to go, that's okay too. And I'll be here to support you on that decision. But it is your decision. So you can stay and we'll do everything we can. But if you want to go, you can go. You're allowed to go. Uh, is what I said to her. Uh, which is very close to something she said to my grandmother. And yeah, about five minutes later, she, she passed away. It, uh, it's, the estate work is necessary. I mean, it's something you need to do. But it is a constant reminder of everything you've lost. And it's something that has to happen immediately. It is uh, busy work. It is legal work. It is paperwork. And I had to consult with a lawyer because of her very limited estate. She was able to fill out a, uh, a smaller estate uh, that goes through much quicker than, than it would be if she had real property. Uh, but even with that, because of her creditors, that was complicated, right? And I had to re go through the entire process again that I'd already gone through with the guardianship in telling them, listen, there's nothing left in the estate now and there is nothing to get. You can claim all you want. It's not going to do you any good. Um, she had uh, no life insurance, which is not exactly true. She had life insurance, but I had to cancel it because everything goes to the long-term care facility um, as part of the, the agreement. So she couldn't have that life insurance come out of her Social Security. That everything had to go minus $30 a month that went into an account. So everything that you have coming in goes to them. So I had to remove the, the life insurance one week before she died. So I had to pay for the cremation, which means I'm the first person to get paid back. So the $400 she had in her bank account went to me and my brother. That's it. And then she had a vehicle and the remainder of that went to me to pay back the cremation that I paid for. So uh, yeah, you have to transfer their mail. So. You'll be fine. You'll be thinking about nothing. And then there is a letter from somebody, right? There was a Christmas card, so I had to call that person or I wrote that person. Sorry, she passed away. Uh, a company came, a, a scam, automatically knew that she died and was trying to fish around for information so that way they could work on the creditor's behalf and get, uh, get money. And uh, I didn't fall for it because they wanted me to give them information. I'm like, well, you should have the information. Well, it doesn't work that way. I'm like, then, then don't call me. Call me when you actually have, I don't know who you are, you know, hang up. But apparently this is a, a completely normal scam that happens all the time. Uh, that is semi-legal. You are free to give information or not give information, but they don't tell you that. So you could hook yourself into this company trying to do uh, credit collections that have nothing to do with the actual creditors. They're like a, a third party, just, yeah. Uh, yeah, and then weeks go by and you think you close something and then nope, there's a, here's a notice, here's a legal notice about this. And then you gotta take care of it. And then, uh, you know, filling out the paperwork, go back to court and, you know, refile something in court uh, to close the estate. And then, no, oh, there's something else. and got this bizarre check that just showed up out of nowhere. I'm like, what is this? Oh, this is the credit for um, for something. I'm like, well, she never paid that money out. Well, it's yours. I'm like, no, it's not mine. She never paid this out. I have to reject this check. You're going to mess up my estate by just receiving money that she never paid out. Said so the state paid that out. Give that money back to the state. So they had to go do that. And, you know, like a normal person would have just taken the money. But that would have been a mistake. 
big mistake. So, yeah, you got to do all of that, and then you have to satisfy the state, or at least for the Medicaid uh, part of it, you know, and make sure that they, they're they allowed to claim part of the estate. Uh, but there's nothing in the estate, and there's rules on what they can collect, and you have to look up those rules, and it's back and forth, man. Yeah. That is, uh... It's just waiting for all of us, I guess. Uh... The crater you left me, you leave behind. Um, I mean, not just emotionally, and I miss the small things. Uh, calling up and talking to my mom once a week, you know. Having somebody to just call when you're feeling lonely. Uh, it's when I realized, and it's what I was getting to in the beginning of the video. Uh, yeah, other than my wife and my mom, that's pretty much all uh, people I talk to. Even my friends. I don't talk to very often. Uh, they don't talk to me. So, uh, I realized that once she passed, right? So, even the um, online friends, you realize, wow, this is, uh, this really is a temporary acquaintance. Just, just nothing. Just an absence. That's the uh, thing I felt more than anything, is this vacuum of absence with people in life. Uh, hollowness. So that's what I've been going through. And that's it. So from Dixieland Farm, thank you so much for listening to my story. You didn't have to, and this is way too long. Take care.